Hi there, everybody. It's uh, David Roach, Quantum Economics and Independent Strategy. <clears throat> We're going to be talking today about uh, untying the knot between global supply chains and globalization and what it means for the economy and for you. First of all, I guess the best thing we can do is actually decide what globalization actually was. Well, put it in its simplest form, it was when the populations of China and all those countries behind the Iron Curtain were liberated and could go forth and seek gainful employment, supplying the world with investment and consumer goods. And this brought a vast new supply of labor into world markets. And the result was twofold. The first result was, of course, the supply of goods uh, on a globalized basis, moving from where they were produced to where they were consumed, became a major force in world economies. But because the supply was increasing so fast, that actually reduced the price. We'll come back to that in a second. The other impact was, of course, because the labor supply was increasing so fast, wages and salaries actually fell. And not in terms of reducing living standards, because goods which were traded uh, were becoming cheaper all the time, but certainly in terms of gains from people employed in factories, right up into the middle classes of Western societies, there is no doubt that globalization uh, reduced and depressed wages, at least their growth, and in many cases, the absolute amount that was paid per hour. Now, these are the things that we have to bear in mind. As a question of statistics, uh, globalization really took off, I would say, in the 1980s, probably at the end of the 1980s. And if we look back at the figures, uh, in 2008, um, the share of China uh, in uh, global trade, and uh, this is just manufactured goods, was around 2%. In 2020, it was 14.6%. And then during the epidemic, it jumped another 4%, principally due to the supply of the technology for working at home, uh, and of course, for protective equipment, masks, and all that sort of thing to, uh, for, for, uh, to fight COVID infections. Uh, so that's an example of uh, what China did uh, and how it benefited. But that's not the whole story. Of course, if you look at the world economy in 1980, uh, which is round about uh, the beginning of uh, uh, when globalization started to happen, world trade, again, in manufactured goods, and associated commodities, et cetera, was around 20% of GDP. And by 2021, it was 35% of GDP, of world global GDP. Now, as GDP wasn't standing still either, but it was itself increasing, <coughs> this is a huge increase in the share and contribution of globalization to world trade. Now, world trade does not give you the full picture because it does not measure services. It does not in any case measure them accurately in any way. And services were probably at the beginning of this period equal to about 20% of world trade manufacturers. And by the end of the period, it was probably 75%. Again, not properly me measured, and that's coming straight out of uh, my own back of the envelope calculations, but it goes to show that world trade is just so important when it comes to uh, looking at what happened to global GDP. And I would pretend it was a causal factor in causing uh, GDP to rise. In other words, world trade rose, of course, because GDP rose, but it also was a pushing on GDP by making the supply of goods uh, cheaper, more affordable. But not only that, but making the allocation of capital more efficient, making the application of technology more efficient. Because if you can uh, organize your factory to do the job more productively, in China or in Thailand or in uh, Vietnam, then uh, by moving it there, you will actually increase uh, world GDP uh, more than if you kept it at home and labored on in an uncompetitive situation. However, uh, there is absolutely no doubt that uh, globalization is the most unpopular 
form uh, of increasing global living standards uh, that I have ever known in my lifetime. And the reason for that is very simple. Uh, it increased inequality, uh, not only in places like China, which have got income and wealth distribution patterns which resemble uh, the worst of the emerging markets like Brazil, but worldwide, it made uh, vast swathes of the working population in developed countries poorer uh, because they lost out. Now, how did they lose out? Number one is they lost the jobs of course in manufacturing because they moved and they were probably not skilled or educated enough to get jobs in the new growing sectors, which went to people with higher skills. So the people with higher skills got paid more and the people who lost their jobs got paid less. So income differentials widened hugely. And of course, uh, these people who lost felt left out and they started to resent globalization enormously. At the same time, of course, because globalization increased supply uh, from cheaper sources of uh, manufactured goods uh, and indeed services in some instances, it pushed down uh, inflation. As it pushed down inflation, central banks uh, reduced interest rates and bond market yields fell. As those things happened, uh, asset prices rose. Now those asset prices are principally, let us say, bonds and equities. And as those prices rose, the people who own them became wealthier. But if you look at the distribution of who owns those assets, it is the rich and not the poor. It is not even really predominantly the middle classes, maybe in their pension funds and things like that, but they don't really feel it in their pocket every day. So essentially the disinflationary process, which uh, globalization uh, contributed to in a very meaningful fashion, created wealth disparities between uh, the haves and have-nots as well. So in the, end of the, in the end, globalization became hated. And of course, uh, given the advent of populist politicians who reflect popular moods rather than any uh, educated analysis for their opinions, um, the politicians responded. So globalization uh, is really uh, in many respects on the way out. Now let's look at the consequences uh, of that and look how it has happened. In actual fact, if you go back into history, you will find that uh, globalization in terms of the liberalization of markets, liberalization of international trade, that peaked out in uh, approximately the year 2000. From that date on, uh, there was increased uh, measures by governments to impede trade, uh, so regulation. Uh, and there were increased tariffs from that day on. So it started way back, the end of globalization. It started when people said, okay, well, uh, all this palaver and talk about uh, free markets is all very well, well and good, but they have to be limited because they are creating too much inequality and resentment. So in a sense, it's the reversal point for the extreme liberal economic view that the world doesn't need any form of regulation. The smaller the government is, the better, uh, and let, let the markets rip. That started to reverse as far as globalization already in the year 2000. That's a very important point because of course, then a number of things happened which called it into question even more. Uh, let me say that one thing that happened uh, is of course, uh, the great financial crisis. That caused globalization uh, to take a back step but it was a back step. Actually, when the effect of the global financial crisis waned, uh, globalization in terms of international trade as a percentage of GDP and in terms of the growth of international trade bounced right back. Where it really took a hit was with the pandemic. Uh, it was already, as I said, from 2000 starting to go down uh, in terms of liberalization. But from uh, the advent of the pandemic, it became impossible uh, to move goods in the same way as we did in the past. And that caused globalization to uh, really fall away. Uh, you couldn't get things, you couldn't get containers, you couldn't get goods into containers, you couldn't deliver to them the way they were wanted. So the pandemic added to the uh, deglobalization pressures. But before that actually happened, of course, Trump's trade war with China was already uh, putting a lot of pressure on corporations operating global supply chains. Uh, 
and many of them up to about, uh, by opinion polls, only about three quarters of the foreign corporations operating in China uh, said that they would actually like to move their production to another country and out of China. Uh, partly that reflected the fact that China has become more expensive and labor rates have risen, but it also reflected the fact that uh, there were more and more uh, trade protectionist measures imposed on uh, the output of companies operating in China. So a fair number of them moved to places like Vietnam, uh, Taiwan, and so on. Not a huge, huge amount, but it was significant. Uh, so to put it in order, the first thing that uh, started to really accelerate deglobalization uh, happened as far back as, as uh, the year 2000, which is the regulatory reversal. The second thing was Trump's trade war. And the third thing was the pandemic. Now, then of course came a lot of other things. For example, the hacking of uh, various corporate and government accounts uh, by players both from Russia and China exposed the vulnerability of supply chains, not only global supply chains, but domestic supply chains like uh, energy suppliers in the United States from domestic sources with out of date hardware and software that fell victim to this. And this focused the minds on people that you really should uh, have control over your supplies, over your supply chain. And the very fact that you had these uh, incidents uh, has marked another significant step in building up pressure uh, on global supply chains and in making companies pay a premium to produce things perhaps less efficiently, but produce them closer to home. That, that is, a, is a key factor. Uh, another key factor uh, is the blockage of the Suez Canal when uh, containers full of goods and services, not only on the ship that actually blocked the canal, but on, on dozens and dozens and dozens of others did not actually reach their destination. Again, people reminded that global supply chains are infinitely uh, vulnerable to very small disruptions. We also had disruptions among uh, internet carriers. I'm not talking about the Googles uh, of this world. What I'm talking about is the actual companies who supply the background skeletal framework for data to flow around the world, the people who actually plug the cables into routers and so on behind the scenes. We've had at least two major disruptions to that, uh, to those networks, uh, which resulted in very widespread outages, which again, reminds corporations that doing business on a, uh, with a global supply chain network is a risky thing. So to wind that up, those, those factors, what that actually means is that corporations are prepared to pay a premium in order to secure uh, their supply chains. And that uh, means that they will automatically reduce their dependence on global supply chains and on, of course, globalization. Now, if that were all, that would be quite enough to say that this is a pretty major effect, but it is not all. Perhaps the biggest element uh, coming out of the pandemic is the fact that we are going to have big governments uh, we're going to have a lot of social inequality because the pandemic made people with low skilled jobs, they first of all lost them, now they can't get them back. And they really cannot compete in the marketplace for where the jobs are being created, which are very high skilled. So the winners and losers uh, uh, polarity is actually getting more extreme. The same is true for wealth because wealth did not go backwards in the pandemic. Wherever you look, you will find that the, uh, the big investors, the rich, uh, made more money out of the pandemic, more money, for example, than would be needed to vaccinate the entire world before you blink, uh, and the extremes are growing. So that factor, together with the fact that government is very big, has uh, huge debts, needs to finance them at low interest rate costs from the central bank, and needs to keep the population quiet, even though uh, social inequality is going to be growing, means that governments will themselves become one of the major institutional backers of the repatriation of jobs, the repatriation of production facilities, be they in services or manufacturing to home economies. Now that will undoubtedly be less efficient in a pure economic sense. It will also mean higher rates of inflation because less productive investment, less productive output actually needs to command higher prices in order to finance that inefficiency.
but that is on where we are going to go. Is it the end of the world? Not really, uh, because coming out of this pandemic, one thing is very clear, and that is what I would call a robot robotization, the increased use of A1 uh, high-tech robots uh, to carry out both service jobs and productive jobs in manufacturing, uh, production jobs in manufacturing. That has taken a huge leap forward. And there are many studies, including those from the IMF and other worthy institutions, which show that pandemics actually increase automation and lead to the loss of uh, the lower skilled jobs in those supply chains on a permanent basis. And that is exactly what has happened. So when the, 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 the semi-populist or central the left governments, which are now uh, the vote in practically all uh, places which get to choose their governments, um, when, they, when they force the repatriation uh, of jobs, when they recreate the national as opposed to the international economy, uh, they will rely upon a robotization, automation of those repatriated jobs, which ironically will not solve the problems of inequality, they will actually increase them. But nevertheless, it means that those corporations can produce at a, 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 a cost level, at an efficiency level, uh, which allows them to exist even in a national less productive economy than an international more productive economy. What does this mean for you? Well, it means essentially you will end up with uh, your shopping basket full of many more goods that are produced at home or very close to home. It means you will pay more for them. And it means that in various forms, uh, you will have to subsidize government as it achieves this less efficient national economy. The inflation rates will be higher. Uh, social transfers to offset inequalities will become a greater factor. And of course, the governments will attempt to make uh, the rich and corporations pay for this probably unsuccessfully, which perils the way to, or makes more likely that we are going into a period in which low growth and low productivity will be the hallmark of the global economy.